Good afternoon and welcome to the Caregiver Teleconnection. My name is Glenda Rogers and I'm going to be your facilitator for today's session with Dr. Tam Cummings. So before we get started, let me tell you just a little bit about Dr. Tam and this won't near cover her background or her expertise, but here we go. Uh, Dr. Tam Cummings founded her company in 2009 with a mission to inspire, educate, and empower dementia caregivers. Now her professional gerontological practice in the Texas Hill Country is recognized as one of the leading educators of dementia caregivers and program design for care nationally. And Tam, we're glad you're with us today. And we're also glad that Vitas Healthcare is sponsoring this session today. And usually we have somebody with us from Vitas, but let me tell you what I know about them. Um, Vitas uh, Healthcare provides hospice services for end of, end of life care. And they are in 13 states here in the country, um, Texas, California, and Florida. And we have a lot of our uh, participants coming from those states. I wanted to tell you that. I'll put in the chat box their web address and also their 800 number for you to refer to if you are looking for end of life care and hospice care. And Tam always has a little bit to say about hospice care when VTOS is with us. So if you wanna say a few words about that, Tam, while I type this into the chat box. Uh, I encourage all of you to not be afraid to ask your doctor if it's time for a hospice order when you begin to see your loved one taking significant declines. And, and it can be, a uh, weight loss that's occurring without anybody trying to lose weight, uh, just the additional progression of the disease. But hospice care doesn't mean somebody's going to die in the next two days. What we're trying to avoid is a family getting that kind of service because the hospice can't even get all the things to your house that you need. But whether your loved one's at home or in a community, hospice care is an extra level of professional care and professionally trained people who are another set of eyes on your loved one. And in research from David Kessler, and David Kessler was the co-author of The Stages of Grief with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, people's greatest fear in life, Glenda, isn't dying. It's dying in pain. And hospice is there as palliative care to keep your loved one from having pain. And it's there to help you. There's pastoral services, social workers, people that come to your house, they come day or night, um, pick a group that's closest to you, find um, the VTOS group that, that's going to be closest to you, because some of those calls may be at three in the morning, and, and it's going to be important to you. So it's a, a trained hospice nurse, RN, they're going to teach you how to do some things in the final part of life, but I ideally, Glenda, I want hospice in place at least the final year, not the final, not the final week. Right. Okay. It's just a layer of care. And those of you that are doing care at home, it can be the thing that saves you. Just having those folks to talk to, knowing that those folks are coming in to be of assistance. That's Dr. right. And they can also provide equipment, which is also, you know, sometimes helpful or not sometimes all the time helpful to those. Yeah, care make a, absolutely, Glenda. Everybody make a side note. When your loved one's on hospice, hospice people can get the Broda wheelchair. It's B-R-O-D-A, and they are the Rolls Royce of wheelchairs. They're completely covered. There's 50 different kinds. They come out and measure your loved one. They're thickly padded. Everything is covered. Your person can lay down and sleep in one. It has a neck rest. Uh, they're amazing, but hospice can get that for your loved one. So use the hospice services and God bless VTOS and all of our hospice people. They're wonderful. We are so thankful that they are sponsoring uh, Dr. Tam's sessions with us. Okay, Tam, do you have a, a little introduction to maybe spark some questions or you want me to just have everybody raise their hand and say, here we go. Well, you know, Glenda and I talked earlier today, like we usually do before uh, we do this to kind of double check. And I had gotten this really interesting um, submission from a lady and then I actually talked to her and we were hoping she would call in but it, it was alarming enough that Glenda and I thought we should at least start with that and what happened is and this is something that does happen and Glenda when I went to look at the research really quickly most families don't realize this company is breaking the law that you do have rights that they're not allowed to do what happened to this woman 
And what happened to this woman was the memory care community where her husband was living said that he was being too combative and that he suddenly became combative with a cane and hit himself. Therefore, they sent him to the hospital. And the minute he went to the hospital, they did what is called a hospital drop. They contacted the wife and said, your husband no longer lives here. And you're not allowed to do that. You have to give notice. You have to give a 30-day notice. You have to notify the ombudsman. You have to notify the state. There are regulations in place to keep this from happening. Now, there are um, some common reasons that uh, this can happen. It can happen because the person is simply dangerous. Um, they're a danger to themselves or a nut to others in the community. Um, it can be that uh, the safety of the others uh, participants or the other residents is in danger. It's not the staff, it's, it's the residents that, that we're concerned about because of their frailty. Um, the health of others in the community can be endangered by this person um, attacking them or running over them. Um, it's appropriate because uh, the faculty, the facility might have ceased to operate and went out of business. So your loved one might be suddenly sent away. But you're not allowed to dump somebody at the hospital and then just wish the family the best of luck, tell them to come get the stuff. That, that is not allowed. So Glenda has some information on a number to call, or is that only for California? Well, this is a California number, but when you told me that this, um, this particular individual was in California, um, and you indicated to me that she had tried to reach an ombudsman, and was told that it would be a couple of days before someone got back to her. And, you know, we can't control that. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. think there's anything in regulation that says you have to be called back within 24 hours or whatever. Um, I was the director of the Area Agency in Aging here in Austin, Texas area. And we had ombudsmen on staff, but many of our nursing homes were way in our rural areas. And so, you know, we couldn't get there immediately is what I'm saying. And so there may be a delay. And so um, I'm hoping that- We've also, Glenda, got to realize that with COVID, we yes. lost staff members in every area right. agency on aging in the country and still trying to get people replaced. So I explained to her, it could be a couple of days. That's not that mm -hmm. unusual, but for her, absolutely frightening. But for the current time, he is in a hospital, as I understand what you've told me. He is safe and secure. And so um, I'm hoping that this individual is communicating with the hospital and talking to the social workers there and letting them know what the situation is so that the hospital won't try and dump him is what I'm getting to, Tam. So for California, I wanted to, if she's on the call, I'm hoping that she has this number also. Um, California has a statewide crisis line uh, that is answered 24 seven, where you can refer complaints there and they will get them to the appropriate people. And so I wanna give you that crisis line number and it's toll free at 800-231-4024. And that's a California number. So that, that's not a nationwide number. Um, but that tells us that every state has- Oh yes. Not only does every part of, the, of our nation is covered by the Area Agency on Aging, which is our federal branch, but we have adult protective services that would direct you to the correct place to call, but you're just not allowed to dump somebody. And remember the social worker at the hospital, that's the person on your side. They're advocating for the best thing for your loved one. Now, Glenda, as we were talking, some other things that can cause a community to want to discharge a person, is number one, they're not a good community. They haven't trained their staff. They don't understand that this is brain damage. This person isn't doing this on purpose. A person can be discharged from a community because the family refuses to allow the person to have the medication that is recommended by the physicians. And because of that refusal to give them medication, their behavior makes them dangerous or um, out of control. And medication is tricky, Glenda, because you got to think. Yeah. Do do I want my mother to stay alive for the next five years and be highly agitated and mad at everyone? Or do I want to give her something to bring that down to where she's as close to being like my mother as she was before the disease started? And that's really what we're aiming at. I explained to the lady that the social worker at the hospital was her friend and 
go for it. And I explained to her she needed to contact the state. She needed to report this community because they are a licensed community and they're not allowed to dump someone the way they did. I advised her to refuse to take her husband back, which will force the hospital to do work with her to see where he can be moved to. I explained to her that it is normal in the course of the disease process for people with dementia to be taken and placed in geriatric psychiatric care, usually for two weeks in order to take them off medicine and then add medicine back in to see what is the correct mixture that will now work on this damaged brain. And Glenda, you and I both know that is another stigma of dementia care. Families feel very embarrassed that their loved one goes to Jerry Psych. And yet in some of the dementias, three or four trips to a Jerry Psych hospital is a normal thing to anticipate as the disease progresses. So I don't think we have the lady on the line, but if, if you're worried this is gonna happen to you um, because of your loved one, talk to the state, talk to the ombudsman. Um, you do have recourse. You can't just kick an elderly person or a person with dementia out of a community and wish them luck. And so just be aware there are laws in place to protect you. But Glenda, the overwhelming number of families are not aware of that. And when the community says we're kicking your loved one out, they're so busy scrambling, trying to find another place to be in the next day that they don't realize this is illegal. Um, Chris is on the line with us. Chris, are you comfortable with unmuting your phone and maybe um, having a, a further conversation about this? If so, you can just unmute your phone. If not, we'll, we respect that and understand it. Yes, I'm here. Okay. So we are so absolutely sorry that this has happened to you, Chris. Um, did you actually, who did you speak to that told you it'd be a couple of days for the ombudsman to get back to you? Uh, I think, the, I don't remember. I just know that that's routine because they are short staffed. Yes. Um, and this just you happens. You know, wheel gets greased, right? Yeah. I'd call more than once for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and did you have that 800 number that I gave out earlier? Uh, yes, I think I did. Okay, good. I'm glad you had that. And I um, made all the calls that Tim asked me to call this morning. Yes. Um, I would suggest that you, you know, maybe give it until this afternoon, but I would call back again. Um, and I'm hoping that the ombudsman will get back with you as soon as they possibly can. And um, like Tam says, what's happened is not, you know, it's not legal to do that. And so you may have to work with the ombudsman in order to report this facility to the state. Um, but my other question would be, you know, you, you need to be looking for another placement is what I would think, because if it were me, Chris, and I'm just speaking for me, I don't think I would want to put my husband back there. No, you're right. I don't want to put them back in there. No, they're obviously not well trained. And um, I'm hoping he has not suffered any type of um, negative consequences at that facility. I, I also encourage Chris to call the state licensing um, yeah. as well as Adult Protective Services because it is a licensed building and therefore they have regulations they are required to follow. Um, the other thing is uh, Chris had mentioned that when she had heard staff in the building, staff was, was not speaking appropriately to residents. I think you said they were screaming and yelling at residents. You'd heard that happen. And so that immediately made me think God's looking out for your loved one and got them to the hospital and got them out of this bad place because we do not speak to people ever like that. Um, I, I was taught the only time you raise your voice is the house is on fire. That way, if yeah. we hear anybody talking loudly, we know to get out of the house. So, um, you know, just what you described, Chris, says this is not a good place. In, in spite of what a beautiful website or beautiful community they might have. What's critical is that your person is um, receiving proper care. Yes. Um, Stephanie had put in here a, a message for you too, Chris. She says, a, a report of an inappropriate discharge can be made to the governing body over the facility. Mm, yeah, that just depends on who owns that facility. 
Um, it will not provide an immediate remedy. In Florida, it takes a few months for them to follow up. And I'm afraid that that is true. Uh, I think it's not going to be an immediate about, response. Is she talking about the state? Who Who's over the state? I, I'm not sure the governing body, Stephanie, if you are meaning who owns the property or is there a board over that property? Or are you talking about the state? You know, so she can probably answer us right there. Um, okay, and I just agency checked for health administration. Yeah, so she's talking about the state. Okay, I just checked with. Um, I had sent messages out after I talked uh, to Chris, Miss Chris, this morning, to uh, friends of mine who are executive directors of memory care in Texas and in Florida, and they have both responded and said, absolutely not. This is illegal. And a lot of companies do the hospital dump. And I mean, it's done enough that in our field, it's referred to as the hospital dump. So the next question would be, is, is there a need for a medication change? And Chris, you and I this morning talked about doing an assessment on your husband for pain, doing an assessment for anxiety, and doing a visual assessment. And Glenda, I'm, I'm going to move close to the screen right now. Don't, don't yep. be afraid of people. This is me up close and I really am old. But <laughs> I first check to see how is he seeing? Can he see my hand coming towards his eye? Because it's normal that vision changes to this. And Glenda, if I'm a naturally a fight person, not a freeze or a flea person, if you suddenly jump out of nowhere, I may hit you. And then I'm labeled as combative, but it's really the staff's fault for not knowing I can't see. After this, vision becomes a periscope. And Glenda, that's all you see is what's through that periscope. And one of the ways you can identify this is your loved one can't see the food right in front of them because there's no visual field here, 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 here. But I can see my neighbor's food. You know what, Glenda, she's fat. And look at her, they gave her pie. So I'm gonna stand up and reach for her pie the family thinks everybody, oh my gosh, my person's got no social skills, and it's that I can't see. As the disease progresses further into stage five, into stage six, now the person only sees through binoculars. So Glenda, if I don't put my eyes right where your eyes are, you're not actually seeing me. That's why a lot of men think they've died and gone to heaven, because when they're in communities, what they're seeing are boobs, bellies, and butts, unless the staff comes down and looks in their eyes. <laughs> And some people will end stage six of the disease when so many other terrible things are happening because of the amount of brain damage. Some people actually lose vision in the left eye, Glenda, and all they can see is this tiny tunnel in their right eye. And they are most frequently labeled as combative. And what happens is once the person is labeled as combative, the whole staff begins to treat that person differently. So Chris, in the weirdest, most awful way, you've been handed a gift to get your husband out of a terrible, terrible place because it is evident that they're not doing good care or they would have, they would have been able to address the, his behavioral issues with you. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. I lost Glenda's picture. No, now I, I'm, uh, I'm here. I'm definitely here. Um, Chris, we do have a contact out in California. And so if this doesn't work out for you, um, I, how should we do this? You can call the customer service. Linda's service. going to break out the big dogs. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can call our customer service representative and I will make sure that she has the information you need to get in a hold of um, this individual in California who is going to be far more um, informed about the California system than I am because y'all out there in California have a bit of a different system than than we do in many of the other states, Chris. I'm so glad that you called, Tam. I'm so glad that you joined us today. And as we go forward with the call, if you have more questions, please do not hesitate to raise your hand, put it in the chat box or unmute your uh, microphone because we're here for you. Uh, and we really mean that. And for those of us who were laughing a few minutes ago about what Tam said, about what people are saying, we're not being disrespectful. I promise you we are not. This is a serious conversation we're having, but as that goes, you have to put some levity into it or you're gonna absolutely go bonkers. And so. Please forgive us if you were offended by that. We did not mean it to be offensive to you. So Chris, I'm gonna go ahead and mute your phone. Okay, my husband is always looking down. He doesn't look up. He's always got his head down and looking down. 
that's the progression of the disease process. Oh. Okay, so if y'all go to my website at the bottom of the page is a list of tools that are routinely used in gerontology, but families may not be aware of them. And on those tools, you'll be looking at the dementia behavioral assessment tool, start in stage four, check off everything that you have seen your husband do and keep checking until you finish checking. And that will tell you how advanced his disease is. And then every two months, come back and look to see where he's declined to now. And that gives you an idea of how quickly the disease is progressing. Now, a couple of other things that I want to talk about that, that Chris mentioned when she called. One was that uh, Chris's message came through to me from California uh, before the, the butt crack of dawn. And it uh, turns out Chris wasn't sleeping. And we know that this is something that's very common with family caregivers is you're not getting enough rest and not getting enough rest is one of the things that helps you deal with stress. Uh, getting rest is one of the things that helps you survive the disease. Getting rest is one of the things that lets you get prepared for the next day. Uh, it's just critical that you get rest. But Glenda, how many caregivers do we know who have insomnia? Professional caregivers and family caregivers. And so too many, <laughs> way too many. So I go to something on YouTube because, you know, Glenda, I love free. I go to the mindful movement and that's the name of the group is the mindful movement. And Sarah Rayburn has everything from eight minute to 20 minute meditations to one hour to four hour sleep meditations. And I have been using Sarah for the last three years, Glenda, and six months ago, I got to turn it off because I, I started getting back into where I could actually get to sleep. When I graduated from the mindful movement, I started listening to all night long thunderstorms on YouTube, whatever kind you want. You want loud crashing thunderstorms, you want gentle rain, you want rain in the ocean, you want, it's all on there. And it's for eight to 10 hours, but human beings respond to that white noise and it will help you get to sleep. And it's critical that all of y'all get sleep. Another little sneaky tool I use on YouTube, and I, I told my therapist if I'd found her first, I would never come see you. But I go to something called therapy in a nutshell. And this is a licensed therapist out of Utah, and she does eight to 15 minute nuggets of therapy. And it's how to deal with anxiety, which is what if, what if, what if. It's how to deal with depression, which is coulda, woulda, shoulda, and living in the past. And it's, there's, she's got a couple of hundred things up there. It's free therapy, and it's really, really beneficial. If you are not doing breathing meditation, I encourage you to follow the mindful movement or Deepak Chopra, which is D-E-E-P-A-K, Chopra, C-H-O-R-P-A. Dr. Chopra is actually an MD who's one of the highest thought of people who research and use meditation. And he's got like 450 free meditations on YouTube. Or you can give him $100 and go to his website and do them there. I prefer the free on YouTube. And during COVID, I actually went through all 450 of them three times as I was dealing with COVID. So little emergency things to do because Chris, this morning, I was so worried that I just couldn't reach out and give you a hug and say, you know, we're, we're here for you. But when I'm overwhelmed, Glenda, and I can feel that I, I, my brain is so overwhelmed, I'm stuck. I go to the freezer, I get a ice cube. I come back to the sink. I wrap my hand tightly around the ice cube. I shut my eyes and I take 10 deep, slow breaths. And when I finish those breaths, but it's actually usually on breath seven, I have to drop the ice but I'm instantly calmed down within 30 seconds, Glenda, because the part, the, the brain's thing is to monitor the body systems. And when you're feeling overwhelmed and you can't think one more minute, it's because your brain's got too many windows open. The ice 
makes your brain shut those windows because the brain can't figure out what just happened. There's something in your hand that's freezing and now it's burning and now it's drippy and now it's wet. And the brain will shut down everything. Drop the ice, take those three final breaths and you should feel yourself calm down. Other things are when you're feeling overwhelmed, lay down on the couch and look up and think about what you're thinking about. Lay down on the bed and look up. Simply changing the perspective of what you're looking out at calms you down. Stomp your feet. Stomping your feet, Glenda, makes your body realize that it's not flying apart, that you can deal with it, and it literally grounds you, that you're okay, you're still here, and you're doing this. A really hard one for families, Glenda, is the scream one. And I recommend the scream one because how many people who listen to us, Glenda, are actually very angry underneath all of the horror, all of the anxiety, all of the fear, all of the exhaustion lies a whole lot of anger. And when you look at anger and fear and depression and anxiety, they're all connected in the brain, the, the, when you look at a dementia person, you actually have to rule out, am I watching pain? Am I watching anxiety? Am I watching depression? They're all very similar together, but we've got to get the anger out. And here's the reason why. Glenda, you know how you can have a glass and you can fill it all the way up with water and it's full, but then you can put another tablespoon of water in and all the water does is bow. Mm -hmm. Then you put a few more drops in and does the water empty? Or does the bow remain and only a few drops run out? Full glass of water represents the anger in a family caregiver. And Glenda, how could you not be angry? This isn't what retirement was supposed to be like. Your loved one may not have Alzheimer's, therefore their form of dementia doesn't look like everybody else's form of dementia. How many of you had a physician sit down and spend four hours with you to explain what the disease was going to do? How many of you were immediately connected to a support group? How many of you had your loved one and you treated as though this was cancer and we're immediately going to connect you up with care? How many of you have family members that have ghosted you, friends that have ghosted you? And so all of those things lead to this slow buildup of anger, which is very dangerous for us. And so Glenda, this is how you get rid of it. And you got to be ready because it scares you. So a couple of things I want you to have ready is first of all, we do this at night because for most people, the first time you do this, this is exhausting because you're going to try to stay focused on anger and not cry. Crying will move you to another state and you're trying to empty your vessel of anger. Now, you're not, you won't get it all the way empty, but we can get a lot of it out. You're going to turn on the shower, turn on the TV, put the dog and the cat at the neighbor's house because you don't want to scare them. You may even scare yourself. So be aware that you may have such emotion in you that it actually scares you. Have a cup of hot tea. I think a bubble bath is certainly warranted when you get finished. And the hot tea, Glenda, is because your throat's going to hurt. Then you take a, a kitchen towel, you take a washcloth, you twist it very, very tightly, you bite it, and then you scream anger. And you scream it as hard as you can and as loud as you can. And the towel is to block the sound that you're going to make, also to keep you from biting your tongue, but also to give you something to put some of that grip and energy on by biting down onto that towel and screaming how mad you are at dementia, how mad you are at the doctors, how mad you are at your family, how mad all of us are, Chris, at this community, how mad we are about this disease. And then when you're done, let yourself cry. Respect what you've just done for yourself, for your body. Take your bubble bath and pour yourself into bed and try to get a good night's sleep. Put your phone right next to your bed and put on the mindful movement. Put on a thunderstorm, but try to get a good night's sleep. And Glenda, you have to come back and do that anger thing multiple times. It, it's not at all unusual because the disease continues to change your loved one. And all of those things hurt. I got a call last week, Glenda, or I got an email from a family that I've, I've worked with for a while. And when I started working with them, it's a second marriage. 
And the person with dementia's children live on the other side of the country. And the person who is the other spouse, that spouse's children are the ones doing care. And when I met with them and we were talking about what the future would hold and how they would make their plan, I told them, her children are going to tell you they don't want to know anything else and keep them off of the communication page. And your children will be the one that step up to the plate. And he sent me an email to tell me that that was exactly what had happened. And that at the time when I told him that they couldn't believe that her children would do that. But that is a, a common thing. Some of you are going to run into family members that can't handle it, that can't do it, aren't going to do it, don't get it. And that's normal. It's just terrible because it leaves you feeling that much more isolated. And being isolated is extremely dangerous for family caregivers. Did that all make sense, Glenda? Absolutely. It is the reality of it all. So have you done the scream? Me? Uh-huh. No. <laughs> I, I probably should have when I was a caregiver, but since I'm past that now, um, I think it helps. But I have to say, the ice cube is my favorite. I like that one, and I use it. The ice cube, I, I've actually pulled off the, the highway, walked into a convenience store, got a handful of ice, stood there with my eyes shut. I, I know they thought, where'd this crazy lady come from? And then I dropped the ice and walked out, and it was safe for the other people on the road again because uh, I wasn't happy, as I recall. Yeah. But use those techniques, other things to help calm down, the meditation coloring book, and apparently Cracker Barrel sells them, and they're much cheaper at Cracker Barrel. Who knew? Who um, knew? There's Not all anyone. sorts of things you can do to start bringing meditation and mindfulness into your day to help you survive the journey. So there's two points of this. One is to help you understand what's happening to your loved ones so you can be better educated, do better care and help your family. And the other one is to make sure you survive because you don't have the terminal disease, yet your own risk of death is high. Well, that ought to be depressing, Glenda. Oh yeah, yeah, right. Uh, Barbara and Chris, I see your messages in the chat box. Let me see, uh, Louise had had her phone unmuted. I mean, her mic unmuted. Did you have a question, Louise? Apparently not. So let me mute that back and go back over here. Okay, Barbara says, hi, this might be a new one for Dr. Tam. My partner has FTD. He is due for a colonoscopy. And as you know, with his food obsession, I don't think that little thing is in my way. Okay. <laughs> I don't think I will be able to handle the 24 hours in prep before. Don't I have enough as a caregiver than to worry about how I can accomplish this? Any suggestions other than not to have one? Hmm. Uh, well, when you said FTD, I'm assuming you meant behavioral variant FTD because you mentioned the food fixation. So does that make sense to who asked that question? That yeah, was Barbara. So should be behavioral variant FTD if there's a food fixation? Says correct. Correct. Okay. So um, the question is, this is a very aggressive dementia. Your partner is a young person. They're not in their 80s or 90s. They have a terminal brain disease. You are never going to get them to sit on a potty all night long and go through that process. And what is the purpose of the colonoscopy? They have a dying brain that's killing them. What's the purpose of the colonoscopy? Do you, do you see what I mean? You, you have to remember that doctors want to be doctors. Surgeons want to cut you open. Surgeons want to cut your loved one open. And they're not necessarily looking at, is this the best end picture for this person? And it's uncomfortable. Um, I know I, ha I have friends who cry when they have to do that. And according to my mother, it's much nicer than it used to be. But you've also got anesthesia. You've got why in the world would you do that? And the eating of food and gaining of weight is normal for behavioral variant FTD. So what would be the purpose? So for all families, you've got to remember in the final three months of your loved one's life, doctors are gonna start throwing tests out at your loved one, all of which involve pain. 
and there there's no you you have to really balance it with my loved one has a terminal brain disease is this critical to their care and if your loved one has behavioral variant ftd that is a very aggressive dementia if you're on this phone call i'm guessing they're already in stage five you're looking at somebody in the very final part of their life why would we do that to them and i don't even know honestly glenda i don't know how you would get a person with ftd to sit down on the toilet and, and go through that mm. hour mm -mm. i don't think it's possible it's and you could you couldn't do it and have them in a house with food because oh. every time they get up they're going to go right back to their food fixation so right. I, i'd really question what is the, what is the reason for doing this yeah and we've talked about this several times on calls about medications even you know, at what point do you discontinue high blood pressure and cholesterol medication? You know, uh, do you want to prolong the agony that these people are going through? Um, and, and what would your loved one tell you? Would your yeah. loved one say, I'm missing a pound of brain tissue. Could you just feed me chocolate and let me go, please? Or would your loved one say, I don't care what it is. Give it to me. Keep me alive as long as possible. And mm -hmm. understand. That's, that's where your loved one is. They've got significant brain damage. You know them better than Glenda and I do. What would they tell you? To do? For sure. And Barbara agrees with this. She says, thank you that she agrees. Yeah. So maybe Barbara, she just to share a little thing with you. I had to have a colonoscopy and yeah. uh, right yeah. when they're about to put me under three nurses, look at me and they say, Hey, Tam, do you remember us? And, you know, I graduated Lampas high school, went off to college and never came back. My mother, my family live in the country. So I was rarely in the town. And I said, do I know you? And one of them said, well, you used to sit next to me on the bus. And I said, did I protect you from the bad boys? And she said, yes, you did. And I said, excellent. And the other one said, you helped me with my, uh, my father had dementia. And I said, oh, Pam, Pam, I realize that you, yes, yes, wonderful. And the other one said, uh, you had me in a class. And I said, okay, ladies, that's wonderful. Was I mean to anybody? And they said, no, because I'm, I'm on the table now. They're fixing to press the button and put me under. And I said, do I owe anyone money? And they said, no, you don't owe anybody money. And I said, do I owe anybody an apology? And they said, no, you don't. That is everybody's cell phone locked up. And they said, yes, it is. And I said, sir, you may proceed. I will go under now. But yeah, scare you to death right there. Three nurses that you grew up with and everybody's got one of these. So yeah, oh, which my goodness. has been good on the website. I'm just saying. <laughs> so Barbara, I think, you know, a lot of times, for families, you have to balance what one doctor who's a specialist is saying against the other doctor who's a specialist. And then you have to balance it. And you're not being the bad person. You're being the person who does what I do. I'm trained to look at every aspect of this person's life and bring it back down to a terminal brain disease. What is their best treatment? And the best treatment is keep me comfortable, feed me chocolate and let me go. And yeah. so if you have a, a doctor who's a surgeon, they want to cut because it's not their loved one, it's their spouse, it's not their mom, it's not their daddy. And it, it's just, it's what they do. I know a heart surgeon, Glenda, if he doesn't get to cut somebody open once a day, he, he looks like he's trying to come off meth. He's just all shaky and jicky all over. Yeah, yeah. So don't feel like you're making bad decisions if you say to a specialist, my, my husband has a terminal disease. What's the purpose of this? Yeah. You have to be the advocate for that person that can't advocate for themselves. And that's what you're what you're doing. And Barbara, go on the website. Don't do the DBAT scale. You're using the FTD scale. And on the FTD scale, you're going to go down the column that says behavioral variant. If there is an X in the box starting in stage three to stage five, it means that the behavior in the left is associated with that form of FTD. Once you get to stage six, there are no more X's in the boxes because in stage six, Barbara, all dementias are considered the same due to the amount of brain tissue that's lost. Yeah. Okay. So it's just to tell families of FTD people where they are in the staging progression in the progression of the disease and that again helps you make decisions about care yeah for sure thank you for sharing that barbara uh, a lot of discussion on that stephanie 
I see that you put something in chat box, but your mic is unmuted also. Would you just like to go ahead and talk about this? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you very much for hosting this session. I appreciate it. I'm a, an employee with the Department of Children and Families with Adult Protective Services in Pinellas County, Florida. And so I have many of my staff have participated in multiple of these sessions that you all have hosted. Today, personally, I'm attending on my own behalf because um, my uncle is, is in this situation now with a diagnosis of Lewy body dementia. My aunt was in denial. He was in denial for the longest time regarding all of it. And then as it happens, everything comes to a head. Um, so he is now in a memory care unit and the VA is the one that says he's got Lewy body dementia. We're kind of struggling with getting what we believe is accurate information. And I want to make sure he's accurately diagnosed. So I was curious about a couple of things. Um, what tests would accurately diagnose that where I could feel comfortable that he does have a proper diagnosis. So he's being properly medicated. And then also I've been reading your book, Tam, which I've read in the past, but I'm rereading it now, like with my family in mind, of course, it's but it's specifically it's more towards, it's, you know, Alzheimer's. And I was curious if there was other, another book that you might have, or what differences I might see between what I've read about Alzheimer's versus the Lewy body dementia. They're, they're completely uh, different, but I didn't understand which book have you read? You're one about understanding Alzheimer's. Okay. Um, there's a new, wow, that's an, okay. So that's a new version of it. It's got old hands on it. Okay. That's a new version mm -hmm. of it. Um, in the itty bitty dementia book. Okay. So in that book, look and you'll find the section on Lewy bodies mm -hmm. in four and it will list all the different forms of Lewy bodies because it's not just one form. And then the minute you said Lewy bodies, you now are looking for Lewy bodies to be joined by Parkinson's disease, dementia. Parkinson's disease, dementia has now been pulled under the Lewy body umbrella. And then you're watching for Alzheimer's to join at the end. These dementias don't look like Alzheimer's. Um, in Alzheimer's, one of the first things you would have noticed is that your uncle was repeating everything he said, and he kept saying the same thing over and again and asking the same questions over and over again. But Lewy body people lose their hippocampus early the way Alzheimer's people do. And without the hippocampus, that's why they ask all those questions. So he is aware that something is going on with him, but it's not really a, a question of denial. It, it's a question of, I might've noticed you did something wrong and I, because I love you, kindly, gently said something and then you chopped my head off because the human brain doesn't recognize it's doing anything unusual. So even in three bodies, he's not aware of what he's doing that's unusual. So one of the websites you guys wanna to go to is lbd.org. And then um, in the itty bitty dementia book, you're going to have a breakdown of Lewy body and how it progresses and what you're watching for. Then you're going to go over to Parkinson's disease, dementia, and watch to see if that one has joined yet. And then you're going to go ahead and back up to regular onset Alzheimer's to watch for the onset of those. And we now expect that if we see a Lewy body diagnosis, is it will be followed by Parkinson's and then, then Alzheimer's will ultimately join it. So when I have had a Lewy body person, um, I'm able to say to them, you have a disease process in your brain. And what they do that's different than an Alzheimer's person is if you say to a Lewy body uh, or Parkinson's person, when I ask you a question, can you feel the information in your brain, but you can't make it come out? Or do you know the information should be there, but it's not there anymore? Or is it just doesn't even make sense? Doesn't make sense is vascular. It should be there and it's not is Alzheimer's. It's there, but I can't make it come out is Lewy body and Parkinson's. That's how they'll answer that question. Lewy body is also very sensitive to medications and they do have psychotic episodes. So you're going to need to download the brief psychiatric rating scale. And that will be one page, brief psychiatric rating scale. And what you have to advocate for is if he begins to have psychotic behavior, 
he gets a drug called Nuplazid, N-U-P-L-A-Z-I-D. It is a non-typical antipsychotic made for Lewy body and Parkinson's hallucinations and for their, uh, any psychotic episodes. He cannot have regular medications. They're very, very sensitive to medicines. They also have a very unique fall. Okay. So they suddenly, they do what is called planking. He will suddenly stiffen like this, all hitting the front of his head and never collapse. He'll fall like a plank or he'll fall backwards hitting the crown of his head, but like a plank. It's not a loss of um, blood pressure. It's not a change in blood pressure and it's not fainting. It's some sudden unconsciousness that we don't understand, but it is unique to Lewy body and Parkinson's people. He also will have constipation that's not related to diet or exercise. It's actually part of the disease. So what we would do in a community is we don't automatically start giving you fiber in a shake and we don't go get another medicine. We give you prune juice. God's laxative, prune juice or fresh prunes, whatever he likes. And I would go ahead and get him um, started on those. But remember, we would start like in an ounce so that your aunt's not having to clean up a terrible mess, okay? He will continue to try to walk even when he no longer is safe to. And is he having any of the hallucination behavior? Because there are four- He's been having tons of hallucinations. So actually until approximately two months ago, we could discuss that. And he was like oriented most of the time. And I could discuss with him about the fact that if Sandy didn't hear or see what he didn't see or hear that, yeah, that was his mind playing a trick on him. Now he would totally not believe that. What happened is my aunt actually yes. fell at home. He, she had my uncle drive her to the doctor, then to the hospital when he shouldn't even be driving. And it took him five oh. hours to get home. She didn't call me. I mean, I do this work. I place people in ALS every day. We get court orders to remove people just like him from the home. So it's not for a lack of support on behalf of the whole family. It was just her refusal to admit anything. So it's she's, so she's <laughs> hospitalized and can't walk. So now we're dealing with the situation oh, and getting oh. things straight, okay. but I still want to make sure the diagnosis is right. But yes, he, he sees visual, uh, visual and auditory hallucinations, people, objects, animals will sit in a chair. That's not okay. there. Uh, let me, let me run through them. Okay. They see children. Yes. Bug spiders, rats, and snakes bad people coming to get them. And that can include a description that sounds like a SWAT team, an army team, yes. or family the factions members. in the facility. Yep. Yes. And the fourth hallucination is that the person can see their spouse or their caregivers having sex with everyone. And these hallucinations go on for hours and you cannot make them logically understand this is their brain playing tricks on them. This is their brain playing visual things and we don't understand it, but that's what the new closet was developed for. So N-U-P-L-A-Z-I-D, it helps to get the pharmaceutical rep involved with the new closet because the cost of that stuff is out the roof. And so get the pharmaceutical rep uh, to be a helpful person for you on this. Um, the new closet will take care of a lot of those behavior issues. And it is that behavior that immediately led them to Lewy bodies because it is so distinctive for that particular dementia. Okay. So is there a brain scan? Because they said they did a scan of his brain and that was how yeah, they determined they would it. See it. You, you would see it. The brain looks totally different. And, and the reason it's connected mm -hmm. to Lewy, but to Parkinson's is um, they're starting back here in the basal ganglia area. Both of those dementias start in a similar area. And it is the destruction of the basal ganglia that begins to cause that movement disorder. And then the loss of the hippocampus and limbic system, the motor cortex and the premotor cortex. So everything you're describing is normal, except, um, you know, I saw somebody for, this, for the AAA last week and it's a little bitty lady who's trying to lift her great big giant husband. And I said, so what happens when he falls? And she said, oh, he has a fall alert. And I said, and it is where? And she said, oh, it's over on that table. <laughs> so that wasn't going to do a lot of good. And then what's your plan when you lift him and he falls on you? And that's over there. So we needed one for her. And then I finally have to go to the horrible story of my great aunt and uncle lived out in the middle of nowhere. He had uh, 
Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. He was wheelchair bound. He was six feet tall. She was five foot two. She had the stroke. When the family found her, they could see where she had drug herself to, a, to the phone for help before she died. He had been sitting in that wheelchair for three days. So aunt, when aunt gets out of the hospital, aunt um, has to call in too. No, she's, he is in memory care in a secure unit. His obsession with all this, it's everyone aunt. doing everything was too much. It was unsafe in his home. I didn't feel safe yeah. staying in the home. The new so will bring that down. Okay. He's also a veteran with pretty, had pretty, pretty severe PTSD at night to the point where they couldn't sleep in the same bed because he was fighting, you know, every night the war. Actually, some that's, reason, another, that's, that's another sign of Lewy bodies, dementia. That's well, already. That's like, okay. Well, that's not happening any longer, but um, I was just very, I was very fearful that, you know, he was not safe in his home. He was continually checking. No, no, no. You've done, you've done the right thing because there's going to continue to be falls. And when he falls, he needs to be where a nurse will immediately assess him, do a range of motion. And if he hits his head, they'll send him out versus his little old wife who might try to just set him up in the chair. And yeah. so you've got him in the right place. And when she comes out, we need a fall band on, on her as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so are there um, any books you recommend specifically related to Lewy body dementia other than the part to, that you have in this yeah. one? Go to lbd.org. Okay. That'll give you some more information. And then for the remainder of his life, he is super, super sensitive to medicine. Something that would knock me out might make him climb the walls. New Plazid, praise the people who made New Plazid because it addresses that psychotic behavior in him safely because it's a non-typical antipsychotic developed specifically for that. And so once you take those hallucinations away, um, Linda, I don't know if I ever told you this, but when I was a, a social worker, uh, one of my ladies had Louis bodies. And of course, back then, all she had was dementia. But every single day, all day long, she had a bad cousin who showed up and beat her up. That was the bad people coming to get me. Her floor was constantly covered with rattlesnakes. So we kept a broom in her room. And when she would scream, whoever was nearby would just come in and kill the imaginary snakes. We had a pillow and a pallet under her bed because she had a child that lived under her bed, wanted to make sure the baby was safe. And I don't know that she ever mentioned sex to me, but what was so scary was that this hallucination, these go on for all day. How mm. scary to think your floor is crawling with rattlesnakes and, and cousin Joe comes to beat you up every day. Every day we had to call the sheriff to go arrest cousin Joe. And of course, none of this was real, but it was real to her. And so now does it, is it paper. common that that happens in her like mixed in with really super oriented times? Like she, he can yeah. ask me something about it's my daughter. Fluctuate cognition. Yeah. He talks to me about my daughter and asks me something very specific. And then he'll have to do something about whatever the kids the kids over there are being too loud or or yeah. the the rat is doing this or whatever whatever he's seeing yeah, yeah. Of... that is that is completely normal that's actually uh one of the hallmark features of the disease and it's called fluctuating cognition so the louis body is a protein named for dr louis and it's supposed to live in the fluid of the brain and instead it somehow moves into the neuron when it moves into the neuron, if it floats in front of the roots or the dendrites and it floats right here, well, now that neuron can't fire correctly because it's blocked by the Lewy body. But if the Lewy body wanders over here in the cell, the cell can fire mm. and the person appears to be normal. Eventually, that Lewy body will balloon. And when it balloons, it kills the neuron. Then the neuron is removed from the body and waste. And now there's another little tiny speck of a hole in the Okay, so then if he's on D O N E P E Z I L, uh, he's on Aricept, and yeah. most neurologists I know would say he shouldn't be on it. Okay, and he's also uh, taking Seroquel. He should absolutely not be on Seroquel. Um, all of the normal antipsychotics are forbidden for people with Lewy body or Parkinson's for the simple reason that it'll kill them. That's why they develop new closet. So the uh, Aricept is extending his life when he's got the least amount of brain and it just gets worse every day. But if you withdraw him from it, you'll have about a 30 day half-life window and then he will decline to where he actually is in the disease. 
And that can be very scary because he can decline a whole stage. And then you go, oh, no, I didn't know it'd be that bad. I want to put him back on and they can't put him back on. But normally in Lewy bodies and Parkinson's, Aricept or Azadine and Exelon would not be given, not by a neurologist who understood the disease. Okay. And then what about the Seroquel now? Seroquel is forbidden. Antipsychotics are forbidden for, uh, for people with Lewy bodies because the antipsychotic medication, uh, the effect of it is that it, it, it works on dopamine and his dopamine is already compromised. So it causes death in Parkinson's people. And well, it, it causes death in all dementia people. It's one of the black box drugs, but it sometimes has to be used in uh, Alzheimer's or vascular because we got to get this person to where they're, we can handle them and to where they're not completely agitated. But for Lewy body and Parkinson's, because they are so sensitive to medicines, Sarah Quill tells me that a specialist has not seen him, that somebody who does not understand medicine or the dementias has not seen him because they would have ordered new closet and they would have never put him on Seroquel. The staff begins to complain to the nurse and the nurse begins to complain to the doctor. And the staff thinks that if I give somebody an antipsychotic, they'll suddenly become a sweet, nice person. And it takes an antipsychotic about six weeks to actually reach its therapeutic value. And many times what they're doing is they're medicating a person because the staff approached wrong because no one's checked them for pain and because no one's got them on the correct antidepressant or anti-anxiety medicine and so because we haven't trained medical professionals to understand the disease properly they end up getting seroquel when mm -hmm. the correct medicine would be new closet well, he, he entered the VA um, not ever really having had a diagnosis with his wife having lied for two years to the VA and to every doctor, including the counselor. And for the last year, she was telling me she was telling the truth, but she wasn't. So See, he and that no would make truth. me think that there's something also wrong with the aunt. Oh, yes, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, she's in, the, she's in a rehab right now. And yeah. she, yes, yes. And, and she so can't. So families will see their family members together and they'll think, well, you know, uncle is sick, but to, between the two of them, they're doing okay. And then all of a sudden somebody falls and you realize, yeah, she's not really like that at all. They just held each other up. Mm -hmm. So in families, it's normal to get focused on the elder person who's clearly sick. And it's not until they reach a certain point that you realize, uh-oh, my other one's got it too. They just got a different form. Because remember, he, you're talking about the fourth most common dementia with him, which means there's three in front. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on your itty bitty book, you want to check Parkinson's, Lewy body, and Alzheimer's. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, thank you so much for bringing that up. I do have to um, step in here for just a moment. We are at the two o'clock hour. Tam, what is your schedule? I'm free as a bird, Glenda. Free as All a bird. right. So we want to get to some other people. Stephanie, once again, thank you. Very complex situation you're dealing with there. Thank you. Wait, uh, I have to tell Stephanie something. So yeah. Stephanie, I'm an APS ambassador in Texas, which turns out doesn't mean a damn thing, except they give me an extra ribbon for my speaker badge. And this year, because they thought it was funny, I am speaking from 8.30 till 10.00. 10 30 till noon one o'clock until five in one day because they thought that'd be funny oh there, there we appreciate everything you do at aps and cps god bless y'all but seriously that's a lot of speaking in one day and my voice is going to hurt it is indeed but i know you can do it all right <laughs> yeah. let me go back to louise one more time louise um do you have a question or a comment your phone keeps oh she just Nope, now she unmuted. Do you have a question or a comment, Louise? Nope. Okay. All right. Moving on. Um, <laughs> this phone is weird. I don't know how to work it. Okay. Well, if I'm, I'm going to mute you then if you don't have a question or a comment. Well, I do have a question. I'm okay. Just go ahead. Go ahead. It. Um, my husband was diagnosed about probably almost two years ago now by his regular physician with Alzheimer's. And he just gave them that, that first test, you know, where they give them names of stuff. And then if they can't work, name it back or remember it and stuff like that, it was like a 10 minute test. And then he tells me he has Alzheimer's, but, um, 
he is getting progressively more forgetful and more repetitive, you know, asking question over and over again. Um, he is getting more of an anger issue. And I have health problems myself. I've got a bad leg and I fell and broke my kneecap. So I want to using a cane now. So what I'm wondering is when do I know when it's time that I, you know, I'm not going to be able to. Did I lose y'all? No, she wanted to know when it's, when does she know it's time to take um, when, more as steps. Soon as she said he's repeating everything, he's yeah. in stage five and he's now ready for memory care or nursing community, nursing, uh, skilled nursing facility. So um, when you, that is, person, that is Pam's yeah, suggestion to you. When you stage a person and they reach stage five on any staging tool, that's now an indicator that they've lost at least half a pound of brain tissue. It now really takes about 12 professionals to do their care throughout the day. In stage six, it's 16 professionals. In stage seven, the bedbound stage, it's about 18 professionals it takes to do care. So the marker is once they reach stage five, we would now anticipate professional care. Yeah. So you might want to do that staging tool, I think is what Tam is saying, and it's available on her website. Um, yeah, we'll turn, turn everything it. out for free. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, which that leads me to the next question is, what are your books and which do you recommend um, and what's your latest book? So give yourself a plug. I've got your website up on my cell phone. So I was um, looking at the books that you have there. You can uh, see them on, on the website. There's Untangling Alzheimer's. I think that's now in its fourth edition. There is the Itty Bitty Dementia book, which started out as a handout during a terrible divorce. And the judge said I couldn't write a book, but nobody said you couldn't write a big handout. And then um, there is a book for professionals called The Professional's Guide to Becoming Dementia Aware. And there's also a version for families and that book, Glenda, if you got that family guidebook and then you went to YouTube and looked under Tam on WellMed, you would find every single video that goes with every chapter of that book. You just have to match them. So every chapter has a video that goes with it. And if my person was somebody that I was going to need to do care for at the end of, home, uh, at the end of life, I'd get the itty bitty dementia book for the net what's in my family because they can read it in two hours and we can discuss it and it has all the tools in it so that they can understand we're not imagining this person's actually doing these things. And then if I was going to oversee care in the home, I would want the bigger book because I think the itty bitty books like 125, 136 pages, the professional uh, or the family caregiver book is 350 pages. So it's a, it's a lot more information, but each chapter of it actually matches a secret chapter up on YouTube. Uh huh. Uh -huh. I'm so glad to hear that. I know. Yeah, I, I think know. if you're starting out, I would recommend, and I have read many of these books. The Wait, itty bitty edited. dementia books. <laughs> the itty bitty I would recommend dementia. That. Yeah, it's designed to be able to take you knowing nothing about dementia and in two hours allow you to be able to mark out the dementias your loved one doesn't have and read through and see which ones most closely match your loved one. I mean, most of the time, and Glenda knows this, I'll meet a family who says their loved one has FTD and I say, which FTD? And they have no idea what I'm talking about. And so the information is there. And then occasionally I run into a smart aleck who goes, oh yeah, well, what are the other 128 dimensions, yeah, yeah. 119 dimensions? And 70 of them are considered, are called childhood Alzheimer's, but all of them are, everything's listed. Um, yeah. And like knowing about these different dimensions, if, um, for example, I run into somebody who has served in Vietnam, my first question is, were they exposed to Agent Orange? Because now I'm going to check toxic dementia. So you need to add toxic dementia when you go back to talk to the doctor 
about your uncle. It's Lewy body plus Parkinson's plus Alzheimer's and a toxic dementia as well. And the VA recognizes that Agent Orange causes dementia. Right. Okay. If I'm working with a farmer or a rancher, I also ask about toxic dementia because of chemicals. If I had a professional house painter, I would ask about toxic dementia because of the paint fumes. So all of the rest of them are, are on there. Um, person who had a loved one with uh, FTD, uh, when you read the FTD section, you'll find that there are other FTDs that only happen if the first FTD is there. So frequently it's not just behavioral variant FTD. There are other FTDs that will try to, that will attempt to join. And then anybody with FTD, Alzheimer's is considered a first cousin. Alzheimer's is considered a first cousin of every dementia. But if a person has FTD, we want to know which one, have any of the other FTDs joined it, and has Alzheimer's started yet? Because you would answer. Yeah, I, see that, I see that your hand is up, Susan, but I have a couple of people ahead of you, so I'll get to you. Um, I'm not going to ignore you. Um, Meredith wanted to notice, how does diabetes affect the progression of vascular dementia? Well, it makes any of the dementias worse um, because it's another slam to the brain. And here's the way we think about it in dementia. You and I have something called the blood brain barrier, which is how blood moves into and out of our, our brain and how our brain cleans itself at night. When we reach deep sleep, our brain cells actually shrivel and our brain washes itself clean of broken things, dead proteins. It doesn't want any more stuff that died. It just cleans itself. That's why after a good night's sleep, you wake up going, oh, I can whip the world today. I feel great. But diabetes interferes with the blood brain barrier. It causes it not to work as well. And the process of dementia means that the brain cannot operate the blood brain barrier correctly. So the decline occurs, not just because of the other things that diabetes is doing to the body, but because diabetes also affects the blood brain barrier. And so it's considered like adding a speeder to your loved one's dementia. It's just another blow against them. Mm -hmm. um, Judith wants to know how is sertraline work with the disease? And I'm not sure what that is, but you probably know. S-E-R. T R A L I N E. Yeah. Oh, Zoloft. It's um anti an antidepressant. It's a generation three antidepressant, and it's typically going to be a higher dosage than what um, somebody without dementia would get. And then, as your loved one progresses to the end of life, we now know that you can take them off every other medicine, but they stay on their antidepressant till they draw their last breath. So we do not remove antidepressants. Um, the generation four uh, antidepressants are gonna be things like Effexor. They go to work in a few days rather than six weeks. Uh, some people on the Paxil and Zoloft's, those generation three with dementia, they can begin to reach a point where their brain just doesn't respond to it anymore. So they do get a higher dosage or they get switched to a different antidepressant, but it's an antidepressant. And whether you realize it or not, it is helping. Okay, thank you for that. You're quick on your feet. Uh, Susan, go ahead now, unmute your microphone. Check it up in case somebody asks me something I can't remember. Yeah, <laughs> right there, ready to go. Well, I didn't have a clue, so I'm glad you knew. There you okay. go, Susan, go okay. ahead. I have a quick question about vascular dementia. My husband has had Can we stop for just a moment and admire your fine hair? Ooh, Everybody. Well, breath that's about people. the only thing that's not falling apart. <laughs> it's gorgeous. It's Thank gorgeous. you so much. I like your hair too as well. Thank you. And I love your red glasses. I have been debating. Maybe I should get red glasses. You definitely should. You definitely yeah, I should. think so. You'll get a big, bright color. Yeah. Nobody yeah, exactly. Thanks. Nobody messes with a woman with big glasses on or a scarf. Uh -huh. I, believe, I believe that's true. Scarf on. Yeah. Yes, my friend Betsy taught me that. As I, a love I love it. I love it. I'm I'm all in white. It's not my fashion day. Oh, uh, <laughs> so here's my question. My husband had a stroke 20 years ago. 
a second stroke last year, and he's got um, moderate to severe dementia. Now, he's good in the mornings, but toward 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, he starts getting, uh, he repeats himself, he gets angry, he wants to know, when do I go home? When are we packing? Did you call the movers? Where's the fish tank? Why did you get rid of the fish tank? I'm, I try to become, I think it's I'm vascular, doing a really good job. vascular dementia. And he, he has vascular yes. dementia, which has a higher level of anxiety and agitation to it. So he needs an anti-anxiety medicine. If you look on the website, the Hamilton Anxiety Tool is on there. It's called the HAM-A in all capital letters if you Google it, but it's on the website down at the bottom. You fill that out and call the doctor back. People who have had strokes are more agitated and annoyed with us. And they get very, very angry because they can feel they can't get that thing out. You ever have a word you can't get, Glenda, it just makes you angry? I wish I could say no, but it's not, it wouldn't be imagine, true. Well, everybody does, but imagine having sections that you can't make it make sense anymore. And so that makes sense. Um, and then at this point, you would assume Alzheimer's has now joined as well. And he Perhaps. has, all, well, if you have vascular dementia and live long enough, Alzheimer's joins and somebody who started having strokes 20 years ago would now have Alzheimer's. Right. It would, now, a quick question. And that's why you're seeing that repetition of stuff. And then the other thing is in vascular dementia, they either wake up really alert and it's like they just slowly run out of air as the day goes on, or they wake up really slow and it's like they get energy and then the rest of the afternoon they're energetic. So yours is the early morning is when I would go to the doctor, afternoon is when I got ice cream and something sweet to keep him calm. Yeah, um, what's happening is, you know, he asks the same questions over and oh. over continuously. I know everybody knows Alzheimer's. this. Alzheimer's. But no Alzheimer's. he gets so angry when he doesn't have the answer he wants. Yeah. He's a kind, loving man. He swears, yeah. he gets you, angry. Anti-anxiety. Okay, so you've got several things going on. He's now got damage in his hippocampus and limbic system. That's why he's repeating everything. So if you took a picture of his brain, those systems aren't even in there anymore. There's a big hole where those should be. He's now got massive damage over here because this is formal language. This is singing and cussing. And he's now beginning to cuss, which means he can't find the words over here because this site is dying. And so that's the okay. normal progression of the disease. But you are describing vascular dementia that's now been joined by Alzheimer's. I have a quick question for you. Mm -hmm. um, his doctor put him on the Seroquel. He's on... Um, Seroquel antipsychotic in the afternoon is needed. I and he's also on the loxetine antidepressant, and that's about it for his anxiety and depression. Yeah. Um, again, they go immediately to an antipsychotic, and they are not supposed to. He should instead be looked at for anxiety. So look at your Hamilton anxiety scale. I will. Thank you for and that. Print out the brief psychiatric rating scale. And Glenda, remind me to have Kathy put that on my website. It's called the brief psychiatric rating scale. And that's what tells us if someone's being psychotic and should have an antipsychotic. Most dementia people only have psychotic episodes when they have an infection and they're sick. And most psychotic episodes last less than 72 hours. But we see people in every community who are on Seroquel and have been on Seroquel for months or years, and they're not supposed to be. It, it is against- I, I didn't what we feel know. comfortable. Yeah. So you would be looking more at anxiety medicine rather than an antipsychotic, and you would be looking at maybe changing his antidepressant. And so- that is a lot of reasons. That's why the why someone goes to a geriatric psychiatric unit. Geriatric. It's and we call it Jerry Psych. That's what every doctor is going to call it is Jerry Psych. And what okay. it is, they're there for two weeks with specialists who rebalance their medicines because these people actually study diseases 
versus well, he the, goes to the VA the loved one of a 10 minute in mini mental status exam and said poof they have Alzheimer's and that's not how you test for dementia well I have a quick question my husband also is a veteran and he goes to the VA and they never suggested anything like that he saw well, a neurologist the and VA. they put him on uh -huh. do they have anything like geriatric site psych at the VA to your knowledge uh, every VA differs. Um, we have some massive ones here. Um, if you're in a state that has some of the major forts in it or posts in it, you have we better. We might. We're in Milwaukee, so it Wisconsin. Depends on where you are in, in terms of it. But, you know, the VAs are, are considered a joke medically because the same doctor's not there the next time. They're a rotating thing for either mm -hmm. physicians who are in the military or for physicians who can't get a job at other places. So That's encouraging. <laughs> and then the other thing that everybody on the call has to remember, if it's not a neurologist who specializes in dementia, they don't study dementia. They're just neurologists. It's a specialty to be a neurologist who knows dementia. Okay. Well, I am going to thank you. I have more information from you that I've gotten from anywhere. And I, I thank you profoundly. And I think well, I'm I'll going to your, make some calls. Yeah, get your itty bitty dementia book. And the whole point of that book is so you can mark out the dementias that you know he doesn't have. And now you can go back to the doctor with actual questions that force them to have to send you to a specialist. Okay. And I know if they can't treat you at the VA, we have a legal right to get care elsewhere. One quick question. Would Zoloft be one of those antidepressants? That could yeah, Zoloft help? is an antidepressant. Mm -hmm. Could that, would that be one that might be more helpful? Uh, that would be for the doctor to determine. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have to go. Um, and, and remember, Zoloft is a generation three antidepressant. And maybe we want a generation four antidepressant because instead of six weeks to go to work, they go to work in right away. three days to seven days. So that's much, much faster. Okay. Thank you. Susan, thank you, thank Dr. Champ. So thank you all. Yeah. Okay. okay we've, gone about, we've gone about 20 minutes over. Does anybody have a burning question that we need to address before we sign off for today's session? We'll be back with you next month. Any other question that you need an immediate response to? I did put Tam's phone over there in the chat box for you, and she really does want to hear from you, and she really will answer the call. But as my disclaimer said, if she <laughs> doesn't call you back in a few days, call her back again. She does travel for speaking engagements, and so it may just have slipped through the crack. And all of her books are up there on her website. Um, and I will remind her to put that brief psychiatric rating scale up there. Psychiatric rating scale. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Are you making a note for yourself? <laughs> well, it's just, you know, as a gerontologist, I, I have tools that I've used always. Cornell scale for depression and dementia. And when family members can get their hands on those tools, can fill those tools out and go back to a doctor, you get much better care because now you're talking in doctor talk. For yeah. It's one thing for me to say, I don't know, he acts crazy all afternoon. It's a whole nother thing for me to go and say, he's doing these things. And this is all signs of anxiety. So we need anxiety medicine or I'm seeing all these pain things. We need routine daily pain medicine. And remember, that's one of the big things they don't give older folks, especially dementia people. If they hurt, they tell us they hurt. Well, they have brain damage. Let's talk to that. So yeah. use your pain assessment tool. Yeah. Yeah. Good luck, everybody. Um, Chris had one more question for you. And she okay. wanted to know if you can comment on the new medication approved by the FDA, the Resulti. I have um, I actually sent myself notes on that this morning when it started coming through that it had been approved to see what it is. But again, it's another thing that's meant to be started very, very early. And in our country, we're just not getting to people early enough. But it's another promising thing. It, it looks good from, from what I've seen, but I, it's on my list of things to study today. And is it one of those expensive ones that I've been hearing about? 
Well, you know, Glenda, I, I think that's pretty much their modus operandi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They drop it and spend a billion dollars. The government says, hey, you get this many, this much time to, to char charge mm -hmm. this much money for it. Yeah. And we're so afraid of, of aging and developing dementia. You know, so many people think that's normal, that it's probably a good time to buy stock in that, that particular group. But I, I haven't looked at the research yet, but I did send it to you. Okay, so let's see what else I have up here. Um, jo ha I don't, I'm sorry, I may be from that. Javi uh, needs to call you. <laughs> She's one of the Wellmade Charitable Foundation caregiver specialists. And so it's in reference to her mother. So um, Javi Martinez, may, you may get a call. Uh, okay. Chris says, yes, it's very expensive. Her copay is about $900. Yeah. Mm. And I assume, Chris, that's a month. It's a lot of money, a lot of money for regular. Try, the, try the pharmacy rep. Sometimes the pharmacy rep person can fill out paperwork and drugs can be achieved at a little bit lower dosage. The other thing is to be realistic about what stage is your loved one in. If your loved one is in stage five, you don't want to add anything else like that because all you're going to do mm -hmm. is, is drag out the disease when they've got the least amount of brain tissue. And what are they going to do to you when they come back to haunt you later on? That's right. Oh, one thing that had popped in my mind a while ago when you were mentioning some of these tools and that you do them at one point in time and then you do them again at three months later, whatever, that's really so important so that you have an accurate picture to show the physician, the neurologist, whoever you're seeing. The other and thing that I have always, yeah, yeah. The other thing I always recommend is keeping a journal and I'm talking about a caregiver journal where you're journaling in what's happening at what specific day and, you know, be real specific about um, what you see and observe because you will forget by the time you see the doctor the next time. So I think that's real important. Of course, you can use a journal for your emotions too, which is helpful along with all the other tools that Tam has told us about. Well, I'm talking really fast. We've gone over almost a half an hour, which Tam is always so gracious to do. Um, so I want to tell you that we are so grateful that you have chosen to join us today. Tam and I enjoy being with you, and um, we always learn so much from you. Um, so I want to thank you for that. And is Chris, um, is Chris still on with us? She is. She's she's messaging. She, they took the Seroquel and Dizonopril away and gave him Resulti. Yay. <laughs> Make sure you get a pill for us too. Oh, too. yeah. <laughs> um, Chris, Chris was having such a hard morning this morning. And I really do think if we all just think positive thoughts for each other, it's helpful. So Chris, you got a whole bunch of people thinking about y'all over the U.S. Glenda and I talk about y'all. Y'all don't know this, but we do. We, we do. check in. Uh, sometimes if you say something that makes us really, really worried, you actually get phone calls from us because we will track you down. But if you ever need anything, please just reach out because there are people that are able to listen and, and hopefully help. And sometimes we hear what you say and it makes us cry. So we know how serious and sad and depressing this whole topic of conversation can be. But I personally believe that information and knowledge is power. And that can help you make it through the tough times. So come back. We'll be back next thing. month. And uh, look for the calendar on the Caregiver Teleconnection website for August. And having said that, please take care of yourself so that you can take care of the person that you're caring for. And we, will see, you, we will see you next month. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.